right. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me in the back? All right. All right. Great. Uh, first, I'd just like to thank you guys for coming out to Pi Ohio and for sticking with us all the way to the end here. So hopefully I can uh, make this presentation pretty interesting for you guys. So today we're going to be talking about uh, dynamic pipelining with Luigi. And uh, my name is Trey Hackinson. Um, and just kind of a quick blurb about myself. So like I just said, I'm Trey Hackinson, I'm currently the lead engineer at uh, MobyKit. MobyKit is a uh, local venture-backed startup. We work with uh, data infrastructure and analytics for mobility. And so if you're interested in either of those things, there'll be a little link at the end. We are uh, hiring. So if you like working with big data and the mobility industry, we'd uh, love to chat with you. All right, and I will be your uh, kind of Luigi Sherpa for our adventure today. <laughs> All right, so what is, what is Luigi anyway? So Luigi is used to build complex pipelines of batch jobs, such as for ETL processes. So I know that's a lot of, uh, a lot of buzzwords. So you know, what, what do these things actually mean? I'm sure that a lot of people in the audience know what you know, a few or all of those words mean, but we're really going to break it down with this presentation because if uh, I want you guys to leave this presentation um, really just knowing what pipelining tools are available and how you should build pipelines, re regardless of whether or not you select to uh, use Luigi. But uh, at MobyKit, we use Luigi, and we think it's a pretty great tool. And I think by the end of this presentation, you guys will agree. Uh, so we'll start off by talking about uh, what a pipeline is. So a pipeline is a series of tasks described as inputs, outputs, and their relationships. So a pipeline is essentially this, uh, this kind of dependency graph you see here. So you can think of each box as a task and each uh, black arrow as an input or an output depending on the perspective of the task that you're looking at. So here task A produces an output that's required by B, which produces an output that's required by D, and so on and so forth. So uh, for the example of this pipeline, task D will not be able to run until tasks B and C have been completed because it depends on their outputs. So you can think of, if you had to manage this type of structure yourself, this is a very, very simple pipeline. But if you had to man manage this type of uh, graph yourself, it can be pretty difficult to traverse, especially, you know, we, some of us went to, went to college a while ago, so remembering things like Prim's algorithm uh, might be a little difficult. So Luigi will help you build these uh, dependencies and manage kicking off these tasks for you. All right, so pipelining 101. So this is uh, just kind of a quick introduction into some uh, some best practices you should keep in mind when you're constructing pipelines, so the or even just evaluating uh, pipelining tools. So the first bullet point up here is checkpointing. So um, tasks will fail, and they won't fail due to you know developer error or any kind of you know pro programmatic uh, maladies or anything like that. They'll fail due to things like networking errors or failed disks, things that are very very hard to uh, predict. So you need to have um, the power to basically pick up pipelines where they left off. So if something gets 75% of the way through and then it fails due to a network error, you don't want to have to rerun that 75%. You want to pick up and just finish up the remaining parts of the pipeline. Um, and then the next bullet point is item potency, which is another uh, fancy buzzword you guys can put in your back pocket. Basically, all this means is that running the same task should produce the same but not duplicate outputs. So the duplicate piece is very important here because if you have a pipeline that, up, say, uploads things to a database, you wouldn't want running that same task again to duplicate that data. You would want it to be able to see, oh, okay, these entries are already in the database. That means this task is complete and we can move on. So checkpointing and item potency really go hand in hand in that regard. All right, and then the last one is tasks, inputs, and outputs. So pipelines are composed of tasks which take inputs and produce outputs. So you guys will be hearing that a lot throughout this presentation because it's very, very important. And different pipelining tools will provide slightly different abstractions. Um, this is the one that Luigi uses. And really what I uh, want you to take away from this bullet point is that um, the pipelining tool you choose should have an abstraction that makes sense to you. And I think tasks, inputs, and outputs is uh, pretty clean. All right, so now we'll uh, move on to ETL. So ETL stands for Extract, Transform, Load. And I drew this uh, beautiful diagram for you guys over here. I'm an engineer, not an artist. So thanks for bearing with me. Um, so at the top, we can think of that as the extract step. So we need to pull the data from somewhere. And it's likely in a raw and unformatted uh, structure. 
and then we need to transform it. So we're going to push it through this black box you see here and perform you know, a series of transformations. This could be very simple or it could be very complex. This might be you know, performing some table joins, uh, creating some enrichments, could be a variety of things. And then finally, the output of that transformation is going to be loaded. It's going to be pushed somewhere. So just kind of simply the ETL process is just take some data, transform it, and push it somewhere else. All right, so now that we've gotten through kind of the basics of pipelining, we're going to jump into a, uh, a real world example. So if, if, if you guys want to take a picture or you know, write down this URL or anything like that, I'll give you guys a couple seconds to. Um, this repository contains this presentation as well as the, the code we're going to talk about. Uh, there will be some code in the slides, um, but uh, it's kept pretty brief, so you can refer to the repository for uh, kind of how to run it and things like that, a little more granular. Give you guys a little, little longer. While we're waiting, has everybody been enjoying the conference so far? Nice, thank you in the back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we will uh, go ahead and move on now. Oh, and I should probably tell you guys what the real world example is first. So um, the example we're gonna be walking through is that every time a file gets added to a remote file system, we'll perform some cleaning on it and upload its contents to a database. So you can think of uh, the file being added to the remote file system, we're going to need to extract that. We're going to perform some cleaning, that's the transform stage, and then finally we're gonna upload its contents to the database, which is the load stage. All right, so quick crash course in Luigi. Um, the really nice thing about Luigi is that it um, tries to minimize boilerplate as much as possible, so you can very quickly define um, tasks with a very simple uh, syntax. So you don't need to be you know, some kind of Python guru to write pretty complex pipelines using Luigi. Um, you'll see in the, in the repo, all the tasks that we're about to perform for this total was about 100 lines of code. So very, very brief for um, something that's pretty close to a real world pipeline. All right, so breaking this down. Um, so in Luigi, every task um, inherits from kind of this base class. And then there's three key methods that you're gonna be working with. So there's the requires method, and what this does is it specifies um, what the inputs of this particular task are. So in this, this case, my task is going to require that some other task has completed before it's able to run. Um, and then the next thing that a task needs to, to define, we'll skip over the run method for just a second and come to the output. So this is defining what this task is going to produce. So this is not only the the output of this task, but it's also going to work as the checkpoint as well. So if this file exists, then Luigi knows that this task has been completed and the pipeline's ready to move on. And then the last piece is the run method. So the run method is going to define what this task actually does. So in this case, super simple. We're just opening up the output file and then uh, writing hello world to it. So once this task has com been completed, the output is just gonna be a file with the contents hello world. And uh, something else that's really nice that Luigi does is here, we're referencing a local target, which is just something on your local file system. But Luigi provides a lot of uh, contrib packages for things like S3, GCS, Postgres. So you really don't have to write a ton of code to define complex pipelines to do what you need them to do. All right, and then uh, real quick, just to really showcase uh, how much Luigi is centered around cutting down on boilerplate. They provide this, a lot of nice uh, class decorators that uh, prevents you from even having to write all three of those methods. So this is something you'll see um, in the source code if you check out the GitHub repo. But uh, by using this decorator, we can um, forego writing that requires method and Luigi will handle it for us. So this is doing the exact same thing as the previous. We're just saying that this task requires some other task before it's able to run. And uh, let's, let's get going. All right, so the first task in our pipeline is going to be um, watching for this incoming file and kicking off the pipeline. And so this brings us to kind of our first uh, interesting piece about Luigi is that everything is a task. So if we want to check for the existence of this file, we're gonna package that up in a task. So we can see Super simple, this is the most basic task that you'll find yourself writing within Luigi. 
Um, so all it's doing is it's producing an output. That's this local file. And it's taking a parameter that's going to be used as the name of the file. So if this file exists, this task will be marked as complete. Um, and the other important thing to note about Luigi is that it's a very lightweight uh, pipelining tool. So Luigi does not uh, ship with something to trigger these pipelines. So you would need to rely on something like cron or celery or whatever you're currently using to um, schedule tasks. So Luigi will build that depend dependency graph and ensure that your batch processes are kicked off in order, but it will not, um, it will not actually start the pipeline for you. And now the next stage is going to be to parse the file into a consistent format. So once we recognize this file on the remote system, we'd like to get it into a consistent format so that we can transform it. Because if we're trying to deal with a variety of different file formats when we're transforming the data, that can get complicated really quickly. So we want to make sure that we have a nice, consistent, say, tabular format before we move on to transforming the data. Um, but what gets a little bit interesting here is that um, at the time that, that the pipeline's written, we don't know what, what the file type will be. It could be a JSON file, it could be a CSV, it could be any variety of data. So it's unclear to Luigi what task should be executed in order to properly, um, in order to properly parse that. So we know that this task is going to require a resource from the previous slide. It's going to require that raw input, but it doesn't know what to do with it because this is going to be determined at runtime. So what we need to do is essentially dynamically determine whether we need to, uh, what, what, how we need to parse these file types. So in this case, we'll keep it simple and just worry about JSON and CSVs. So luckily, Luigi provides a way of dynamically requiring tasks at runtime instead of predefining the pipeline. And this is uh, very important for building complex pipelines because older tools such as uh, LinkedIn's Azkaban are purely config based, not programmatic based. So dynamically requiring things like that is pretty difficult. And you would essentially have to build two different pipelines. All right, so we can see um, pretty simple here, pretty straightforward Python. We're just going to create, um, create an abstract task that's going to require the resource we need and then branch that off into our parse JSON and parse CSV tasks. So the run method of these two tasks would be different depending on the file type we're working with. One would be loading in JSON, the other one would be loading in a CSV, and then they'll perform some basic processing to get these into a consistent uh, format. So if you uh, check out the GitHub repo, you'll see um, kind of what's actually being done here. The repo contains uh, pretty basic data. It's just uh, you know, people's names, emails, things like that in JSON and tabular format. All right, so now that we've defined these two tasks, which are the ones in purple, these are the ones that we're going to be dynamically requiring, how do we do that? How do we dynamically require these? So this is going to be by far the most complicated thing that you see in this presentation. I know it's kind of scary. We've got um, Python generators involved here, but this is, uh, this is the most complex thing that you'd run into in Luigi, and it's really not that bad. So we can see here that this is our, uh, this is our actual parse task. This is what's going to dynamically require the JSON and the CSV tasks. So we can see here that all we're doing is we're going to um, check out what the extension is. We're going to yield the parse CSV task if it's a CSV, or we're going to yield the JSON task if it's a JSON. And don't worry too much about the, uh, the parameters here. You can uh, read more about that in the, the repo. We won't get too far into the weeds here. Um, and then lastly, since this is a task and it needs to produce an output, uh, we're going to keep it dead simple here and just kind of read in the output of this, uh, this previous task and write it to a new output so that Luigi knows, uh, knows that this has been completed. All right, so everybody give yourselves a little pat on the back if you've stayed with me this far. I know that that's, uh, that's pretty complicated, but trust me, it's all, uh, it's all downhill and easy from here. All right, so what we just talked about was the extract stage of the pipeline. So that's when we're pulling this data from the remote file system and we are um, putting it in a consistent format so that it can be transformed. And so the transform step is going to be back to nice, nice, simple Luigi land. So we're just requiring the output of that parse task. And then we're going to perform some transforms in the run method and then output it to another file. So at this point, if, say, 
your transformation failed um, due to maybe there's some characters you weren't expecting in the input, something of that sort. The nice thing is you could go in, tweak your transform method, and not have to rerun that parsing stage because Luigi's creating these checkpoints for you. All right, so now we can load the data into its final destination. So this is another uh, place where Luigi really shines. Um, so in this example, we are loading the transform data into a Postgres database. And the cool thing is that, you know, normally you might think, okay, we have to go manage a connection. I have to, you know, import psycho PG, connect, um, kind of do all these things, manually write a query to ingest a CSV, TSV into a database, which, you know, th that's, that's code that you really don't want to manage. So the good thing is that Luigi has done that for you. So here, this is very simple. We're just overriding a couple abstract properties on this uh, copy to table task. Um, that's going to give us our DB credentials. We're defining the columns, and Luigi will handle the rest. So Luigi will create a checkpoint within the database so that it knows once this has been completed. It'll load all the data in, um, and it'll keep it nice and clean behind the scenes so that you don't have to manage any connections or anything like that. All right, well, what if something goes wrong? What if, uh, what if you run into, say, a network error upon loading the data from that CSV to the database. This transform stage in particular could be really time consuming. That could involve running um, some kind of machine learning model. It could involve um, joining against other remote databases. It could, it, it could involve a plethora of things that take a lot of time. Um, so if the load fails, we want to make sure that um, we have nice checkpointing so we can pick up where we left off. And this is kind of the point where pipelining tools really um, start to show their their worth over trying to write something like this manually. So if you were to write a script that say parsed a CSV or a JSON, did your transforms, loaded it into a database, managing the connection, things like that, you'd be able to do that and it would probably work pretty well. But as soon as you started to run into errors, managing those checkpoints is where things start to get a lot more difficult and where um, pipelining tools like Luigi really start to really start to shine. All right, so everybody take a deep breath. We made it through the, uh, the real world example. Uh, thanks for hanging with me on that. And uh, you know, I know that that may have uh, felt like a lot of information since this is kind of everybody's first time with Luigi, I assume, but um, that was a pretty real world pipeline and it was a pretty short amount of code. So I hope that you feel kind of empowered to go on and write kind of whatever pipelines you might need. Um, but uh, I wanna take some time to talk about alternatives. And so um, we'll start off with Pinball. So Pinball was created at Pinterest, and it's uh, very powerful with um, uh, distributed systems, so managing um, tasks across those systems and keeping track of the checkpointing, things like that. Um, but it's very poorly documented, and the community's pretty small. So um, this is one that I'm interested to see where it goes because it is very powerful, um, and if it becomes well-documented, uh, it would definitely be something to look at. But for now, for production systems, I wouldn't really recommend pinball. Um, then, yes, yes, it is similar to that. Um, so, Airflow is an Apache product. Uh, this is one that people in the audience have probably heard of. So, Airflow is a very, very powerful pipelining tool that, unlike Luigi, does ship with a triggering mechanism. So, it can replace things like cron and celery. Um, it also has a really, really nice UI that you can use to monitor your tasks and um, kick things off. Um, Luigi ships with a very basic UI. I would say that it's so basic it's borderline useless, but you can check it out and maybe it'll uh, be good for what you're doing. But uh, Airflow's UI is very nice to work with. Um, but the reason that uh, we just at MobyKit decided not to go with Airflow is because since it does have all of these features, it's very monolithic and large, and we need the flexibility to deploy in a variety of environments, so Luigi really suited our needs because it's, it's nice and compact and small. Um, and then the last one is uh, Azkaban, and Azkaban is the oldest, most mature technology up here. It was developed by, uh, it was developed at LinkedIn, and the main difference between this and the other ones is that it's entirely config driven, so you don't actually write uh, Python code when you're defining Azkaban tasks, um, which can be nice because you don't run into you know, Python errors when you're trying to construct these pipelines, you would only run into, you know, config or pipeline, or, yeah, config errors, but it's very difficult to construct uh, dynamic things in these config files. 
Um, and then I've got a couple sources up here. Like I said, this is in the repo, but if you're currently trying to evaluate um, pipelining tools, I would definitely recommend you read the, uh, the first and the last bullet points. Um, Robinhood had a really nice uh, description of why they chose Airflow uh, over Luigi, and it was mainly because of that triggering mechanism, and since they own all their data warehouses, um, it made a lot of sense for them to have something a little bit more monolithic. Um, and then the first one is uh, uh, just a pretty in-depth analysis of strengths and weaknesses between Luigi, Airflow, and Pinball. Um, and then I've also included links to the, uh, the docs in here as well. Uh, Luigi has really nice docs, so definitely check them out. Their code is also very read readable, so I've found myself uh, in the source every once in a while too. Um, and then for questions, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, also, I'm happy to take uh, like GitHub issues if you uh, want to check out the repo, file an issue there. Uh, the benefit of that is if somebody else you know, came in with similar questions, they can kind of uh, see that paper trail. Um, and then I also uh, should have some time at the end of this to field some questions as well. Um, and then lastly, you know, come work with us. Uh, MobyKit is a very young but uh, very fun and fast-paced uh, startup. So if you're interested in big data or the uh, mobility space, uh, definitely come chat with me or uh, this guy over there afterwards. Yeah. All right. So does anybody have any questions? Packeter, um, if you can, I, I haven't heard of that one, but if you can kind of tell me uh, what it does basically, then I can try and give you some uh, comparison. Yeah, that's what I was oh yeah, definitely. Yes, so he, the question was, would you consider Luigi to be a light integrator? Um, could you elaborate on light? Okay, thank you. Um, so to elaborate a little, the question was a light integrator is in not uh, you know, fully featured. I would say um, no, that it is fully featured. The only thing that it doesn't contain is that triggering mechanism, um, which for the sake of constructing kind of dependency trees and checkpointing with pipelines, I'd say that that's kind of accessory. But in terms of the, um, the community tooling and the actual like execution and like parallelization, things like that, um, it's it's very powerful, um, and it was built at Spotify. I can't remember if I mentioned that. So it is, um, uh, you know, backed by a in big enterprise and used um, by some major players. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was, does it have any uh, ability to optimize the flow? And so the answer to that would be uh, yes, depending on um, exactly how you've constructed your pipeline. So it does build up that dependency tree, and if it sees that things are complete, it will kind of uh, collapse that down and reschedule the tasks. So um, it won't try and uh, combine tasks, though. Like if it sees, say, this task is going to read a file, perform some operations and write it, and the next task does something very similar, it won't try and perform um, those operations within one read, if that makes sense. So it will optimize the scheduling, but not the actual um, run methods. So the question was, is there anything in this library to handle validation errors? Um, so question for you would be, when you say validation errors, do you mean, say, when you read in an input and it, say, had characters you weren't expecting and an error occurs? Yeah, that's that guy. That's Something like that. Really yeah, so um, this, this kind of comes back to checkpointing. Um, so the nice thing is that if uh, it provides a summary of uh, pipeline execution, so if you, say, had um, you know, five tasks and uh, one of the tasks in the middle failed due to you know, any kind of error, even programmatic, not necessarily a networking error or something like that, it will provide you with a summary as to what happened with stack traces and things like that. So it does have um, a pretty good debugging in that regard. Is 
Um, yeah, so you could do that with a dynamic require. Um, so we had that uh, piece where we were um, basically dynamically determining whether we needed to do a CSV or a JSON. So you can think of if you had some kind of task to validate a source, then you could, if it failed, trigger um, you know, a task that would put that in say an S3 bucket for your bad records, and if it passed, put it in a different bucket for good records, something like that. So you have to get a little bit creative, um, but uh, you can definitely do that sort of thing. It, I don't know if there's any contrib packages specifically geared for that though. All right, we got a little more time if we got some more. Right. Uh, yeah, I would definitely uh, agree with that because yeah, the, the the benefit of Luigi is that you encapsulate very small pieces of logic into tasks, and then you really see with all the different community contrib packages that philosophy. So you see, you know, a lot of little bite-sized things to perform Postgres operations. There's Bash tasks. There's S3, GCS, anything you can think of. So, um, and that really encourages good hygiene, kind of breaking these tasks down. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have another question? Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that I'll mention that's a little bit different than that, but one security issue we actually did run into at MobyKit was that you have to be careful with the logging. Um, so when you set up uh, parameters on your task, so you can think of those as things like if you needed to input a date or you know some kind of file identifier, um, it will log those parameters, so you should not use um, any kind of credentials as parameters, which is why in that Postgres task you saw that those were properties, they weren't parameters uh, for that reason. But in terms of preventing uh, tainted data, the, um, the DB tasks that they provide, um, so they have a generic kind of uh, relational like RDBMS task that is extended for things like Postgres and Amazon RDS and Cloud SQL. Um, and those actually don't have the best rollback support. Um, so if you do get some kind of, uh, um, you know, you get part of the way through an upload and then a very odd error occurs that Luigi isn't um, equipped to handle, then it can get a little bit messier there. But as long as you set up your checkpointing properly, it's pretty easy to tell um, of where that occurred so i would say the checkpointing helps with that but there are some some issues with very weird scenarios all right probably got time for one more if anybody's got anything take that as a sign that i should be done all right thank you guys i really appreciate you staying, staying for the talk <laughs>